going to be middle school and high school students. So this is, this is quite, quite a nice surprise. I'm going to ask one of my students, Paris, to come up and help me because she's already seen this demo. She knows it, so she's going to help me with this. Uh, I used to work for Colgate Pahal in their fragrance technology division. So I want to have you guys smell something. Actually, I'm going to have you smell two things. Uh, and I'm going to teach you how to smell. <laughs> so it's a smelling strip. <clears throat> you want to bring it just to the front of your nose, just underneath your nose. You just want it to have, of course. Um, touching your nose, it'll, the oil will get on your nose. It's not dangerous or anything else like that. You're just going to be smelling the same thing for a long time. <laughs> if it is too much, then just go to your sleeve and just smell your sleeve and you'll be fine. Okay, so uh, it is the pure oil in most cases. I think I have enough. So give a bunch to each row. Oh, we have some more. I'm not 
breath. It's like, no, it's okay. Okay. Right. Who is this? Does anyone not smell anything? Is anyone a Gnostic? Do they do not smell anything? You do smell something, right? Okay. Do, you, do they seem to be similar? Similar. Okay. Very similar. You can't distinguish between them. Okay. That's great. Okay. I love that. Alright, so do you, do you now recognize my bread? Anyone? You're not going to go by some bread. Yeah. With, 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 with caraway seeds. With caraway seeds. Okay, it's the caraway seeds. This is caraway oil. Okay? So, but this, the reason I bring this up is because these are two, the molecules are nearly, nearly identical. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so she was in my class. <laughs> okay, so these are the two molecules. We have uh, spearmint on the left here. And let me do it this way. Let's see if I can do it. Uh, I'll do it this way. We will do spearmint on the right and caraway on the left. The only difference. Do you see the difference between them? Do you see the difference between them? What do, you look, what do, what do they look like? They're mirror images of each other. Only difference between these two molecules is one hydrogen's going this way and then one hydrogen's going that way. And guess what? You can tell that difference. Yeah. Just this is crazy. So what happens is you're, you you bring that chemical into your nose, it goes through the membrane, comes in contact with the protein, that's the transmembrane protein. And you can distinguish between a hydrogen going in this direction and a hydrogen going in that direction. That's what I love about chemistry. And that's what I bring to my classes. At least I hope to, anyway. Paris, she'll tell you all the time. She found out right now. Okay, so, but that's why. And, and, and I was a high school science teacher. I was actually a certified high school science teacher in New Jersey for a couple of years before I came to higher ed. So I do know what it's like to teach on a Friday afternoon in the spring after they've all been through lunch. It's a chemistry lab at 2.15. I get it. I was there, right? So you always have to grab those kids. Absolutely. And that's what I try to do with all my lessons, is just try to grab them with something that interests me. And fragrance has always interested me. Okay. And so this, to me, is just a perfect example of something to do. Um, and there's many things that we can do. But um, I think I do have to talk about... Any questions on that? You guys can take those home if you want, you can always toss them, whatever you want to do. Um, so I think I have to talk about how I got to this point, right? A little bit? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure, because I'll talk about anything you want. Um, so uh, so I, 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 think I, I think I always liked teaching, but I didn't know I was going to be a teacher. Um, so I... Graduated high school, I went to SUNY Farmingdale. Uh, it was a two year college. I went there for, I actually was scheduled to be in civil engineering technology, which I'm not even sure what that is. But we, we had to take a placement exam. Myself, uh, about 40, 40 other students. Two of us did really well. The guy who was running the exam gave us a note and said, Go see the Dean of Science. Talk in the note, the next thing you know, we were in engineering science. And so that's how I got into engineering science. While I was at SUNY Farmingdale, I had uh, an organic chemistry teacher, uh, Dr. Pellegrini. He was, I think he was an ex football player, he was about 6'6, six, six, you know, 250, 60 pounds. You know. Just had a fantastic class. He was just a phenomenal teacher. And so then I went to, I went, so I, when I graduated from there, I went to City College of New York, and I went into chemical engineering. And while I was there, I did research with the faculty member there. Uh, that actually got me into Hopkins. Okay, that was I think the, the piece that got me. So if you ever talk to your students, if they have opportunities to do anything outside of the class, it's what gets people into graduate school or even into an undergraduate school, even a summer high school project or anything. It's, it's huge when a student can either write a paragraph or a page or even just come and talk to someone and say, hey, I did this project. It's, it's tremendous. Uh, so that's what got me into Hopkins. Uh, 
Hopkins, I went to Switzerland, and I spent two years in Switzerland at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. It's the, <coughs> there's two technology institutes in Switzerland. One is in Zurich, that's ETH, and this was EPFL, this was the French Union one. So I was there for two years. While I was there, I worked with a person who was, uh, he had some connections with the fragrance industry. Okay? And while I was there, I, I read an article from uh, a person at the Monell Chemical Census Center. This is a center dedicated to smell and taste. And it's, uh, it used to be associated with the uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, yeah, University of Pennsylvania, and then they, they're separate. So it's partially funded by the government, partially funded by private industry. So, for example, Coca Cola, Nabisco, Mars, Colgate Palmolive, Procter and Gamble, they all donate money. And they have access to any of the research that's happening there. And so while I was there, I studied female body odor as a function of the menstrual cycle. So I looked at, you know, I always like to say that, because I was like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this guy's getting weird. So we did collect, we collected both male and female body odor. We collected it, and we collected by, you know, the people have to not use deodorant, not use perfumes, and we have them uh, wear t-shirts with pads underneath, and we collect those pads and extract out the sweat from those pads and then concentrate. And so we looked at, we looked at uh, females when they were ovulating and then when they were menstruating, looking at the chemicals that are different between the two of them. And the purpose was this. Well, there's many things. It's, people talk about uh, women become uh, synchronous with their menstrual cycles when they're in Groups, they're working together, they're living together. Okay, so that's uh, Martha McClintock at the University of Chicago. She was the first one that did that. And so there's always this idea all oh, there's these human pheromones, all oh, these things. That was one thing. And then the other thing was we wanted to look at uh, to elongate the, uh, that ovulation period and to see if we can elongate that time where a woman is ovulating to help with fertilization. So we would collect both male sweat and female sweat. We would also expose women who were ovulating to different kinds of sweat to see if we could either alter the timing or elongate that timing. So we did a bunch of things like that. And that was a really cool place to work. Uh, that got me my next job at Colgate Palmolive. And uh, I just did a project for them when I was at Monell. And again, it was just a little project that someone asked me to do, and I did it. You do it on time, you hand in a nice piece of paper, and next thing you know, six months later, you're like, oh, hey, we remember you. Would you be interested in a job here? So I think that message, if you can get that message to kids, it's, an, it's, it's tremendous. That if they just follow through, if someone says, can you do this? You say yes, and then figure it out afterwards. Uh, so, <laughs> so, Colgate, so I got to Colgate Palmolive. And there I worked in their fragrance industry for about five years. Uh, and that was tremendous. It was really a phenomenal place to work. Uh, basically what I did, I problem solved. So for example, uh, we would get samples from all over the world. And it would be a deodorant sample that has turned brown. And the fragrance doesn't smell right. And they'd say, figure it out. And I'd say, OK, well, what did you do? <laughs> and they'd say, oh, nothing. We didn't do anything to it. Then you find out that they burned the oil or they left it in the sun for three days, or you know something, something happened. So we would try to figure out what happened to these products, because whenever there was an issue, that threatened the reputation of public come up. And so we had to, we always were on top of that. We dealt with it mostly with the fragrance side of it. So if things didn't smell right, you usually lined it up on my desk. Okay. Um, I thought I needed to be at a fragrance house, so I left. Colgate Palmolive and went to International Flavors and Fragrances. They're the biggest company on fragrance and flavors in the world. Um, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. It was, not the, it was not a good fit. I didn't like the atmosphere of the company. Um, it just didn't work. It just wasn't right. But it actually got me to where I am today. So I, right after 9-11, we could see 9-11. We could see the, the crumble because we were right across the bay in New Jersey. Um, and so, right after that, I realized this I have to, I have to make a change. This is not for me. And so that's, I went and I started teaching high school for two years. 
But I taught at uh, New Jersey, or Somerville High School in New Jersey. I became a certified uh, physical science teacher. I went through the two-year teacher training program. Uh, I taught uh, I taught the introductory chemistry, the CP, the college prep chemistry, and the AP chemistry. Sometimes all in one day, right? They just everyone just knew they just get everything at you, right? They throw it at you. So I was there for two years, and while I was there, I did teach at night as an adjunct uh, for the College of Saint Elizabeth. And uh, that I thoroughly enjoyed. Okay. I went back to the fragrance industry with Simrise. It was a couple, it was two companies that came together, two German fragrance houses that came together, Coco uh, and Pomegranate. They became Simrise. I had a friend there, he needed some help. Teachers don't get paid much. The fragrance industry pays a lot. <laughs> so I went back to the fragrance industry. Uh, but I still taught at night. And um, no matter what day I had at work, when I came out of teaching at night, and I taught from six to nine at night, uh, I, I was in the best mood. I was in the best mood. And so that's what resonated with me. And so I, I had an opportunity while I was at Simrose. I was only there for one year. Uh, Elon University in North Carolina put out an ad, probably in June or July, for a physical chemist. So I knew they were desperate, right? Because they needed someone to start in August. So I applied, interviewed in July, and started in August. So, but, but it, it was the best thing I did because one, they were desperate, so I knew I had a really good chance of getting the job. Right? <laughs> Two, um, and this is another thing you might want to tell your kids if you want to: um, fake it till you make it. So I was at Elon University. I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, but it's actually true. So while I was there, I was a visiting professor. But I acted like a tenure track professor. I acted like they hired me permanently. I went to all of the department meetings. I took on students to do research. Uh, I applied for grants. I taught whatever they wanted me to teach. And they had me teaching everything. I mean, really, from 8 o'clock until 8 o'clock at night, they had me teach all different things. And I just said, yes, 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 yes. Uh, so I was there for two years. That got me the job at Coastal Carolina University. And I was there for five years, got tenured. Then at GCU, I got to here um, after Coastal Carolina. Um, came down here for my dad, for a bunch of other reasons. Um, but FGCU really offered me a good position. Um, it was a higher salary, more startup funds to do research, and then I became the chair of the department. So that's sort of how I got into this. Um, I think we have, have about 10 minutes left. Uh, Are we having questions too? Yeah, it's 6 o'clock. Oh, 6 o'clock, okay. Yeah. All right, 6 o'clock is dinner, right? Yeah. Okay, I don't want to keep you from the food. <laughs> I, I, I know that. Okay. Um, let me just talk a little bit about, uh, well, that was the decarbon and the nail color. So let's see. These are some of the things that I, that was supposed to I just want to go to, that's Monell, that has a great sculpture in front of the, in front of the building. It's actually the face of smell of uh, the nose and mouth. Um, let's see. I want to get to, ah, so what I'm doing now, and I just want to talk a little bit about it, um, because, and this is why I meant about, you know, sort of fake it you make it. I couldn't use any of the work that I did in industry in academia. I, was, I signed confidentiality agreements to not. So I had to find something in order to progress. Uh, I knew that I had to do some project with students. And so I looked at myself. Um, I have psoriasis. I have a very mild case of it. This is a very, this is a very uh, drastic case or an intense case of it. Okay. And basically what psoriasis is, is the skin cells grow and die at very fast rate. So what happens is you get these things called plaques. You get the buildup of the skin, and you get this dead skin, and then eventually the dead skin you either peel it off or sometimes it cracks. So it's not a debil it's not a physically debilitating disease, but it's an emotionally debilitating disease. And if you ever see the commercials uh, for the immunosuppressants that are online, they always talk about they always show the person with the psoriasis going for the salivar, and everyone's like Look at that around, you know. It's not contagious, it's a hereditary. Uh, so, but it's, so I had it, so I said to myself, I need to look into this. And so that's what I started doing. 
And what I found was there's an enzyme in everyone's skin that produces a natural sunblock. Okay? And what I found was that not many people explored that natural sunblock or the enzyme that produces that natural sunblock. So you have an enzyme in your skin called histidase, histidine pneumoniolitis. You need to get rid of histidine in your body. If you don't, you come up. Some people don't have that enzyme and they get histidinemia. You get uh, mental retardation and other things. Okay? So you do, you do need this enzyme in your body. It is in your, it is in your small intestines to help break down drugs. But it's also in your skin and it produces this natural sunblock. And so what I found was you know, many, many people use uh, photochemotherapy. They use sun, they use drugs, they use a combination of sun and drugs to, to uh, suppress the intensity of the psoriasis or eczema. But what I found was no one really looked at what's the effect of that process on this enzyme. And so that's what we did with, and I did it with undergraduate students, and we published. And so, uh, so actually, there's another thing. Vitiligo is also another thing that happens. Uh, that's the disease that Michael Jackson had. Many people have it. You'll see it now. Uh, it's a loss of pigmentation. Okay. Photochemotherapy can uh, can help alleviate that, or it helps you with pigmentation. Okay. The problem with these uh, therapies, they also can cause cancer. Okay? And so you have this double edged sword. It's going to help you, but you have to watch out if you're going to get skin cancer. And so I looked at this enzyme and these natural drugs, these natural products, and UV light. And uh, this was actually one of my students who got some of the sorrel on him, and it actually changes. The pigmentation is here. You've got Spot there and spot there. So it does change the pigmentation of this case. He didn't tell me at the time, he told me afterwards. Uh, but um, let me see if I have a light. Let me see if I have this one thing. Uh, yeah. So that's the that's the natural sunblock. And when it comes in contact with UVB, which is what causes sunburn. Okay, sorry. Uh, it actually so this is a, an isomer. There are isomers of each other. One is trans. One's on one side, one's on the other. And then one's cis, they're both on the same side. Okay. The trans is a natural sunblock. The cis, and this is why I got interested in it, the cis is also in your body, and you excrete it out with your sweat. But the cis suppresses your immune system. Okay. And so that's even an example. You come in contact with um, poison oak or poison ivy. If you have a lot of cis, you're or some kind of immunosuppressant on your skin, you won't get that bubbling of your skin and the itchy stuff, right? If you don't, then you'll get that response. So that's your immune system responding to that poison. Okay? With cystiuricanic acid, you can suppress that. Right? And so I said to myself, no one's really explored what happens when you take this photochemotherapy and this enzyme. What happens to this enzyme? Does it get destroyed? And actually, we showed that it does get destroyed. So then that's going to affect the natural sunblock, but it also, which is not good. And then on the other side, it does affect the immunosuppressant, which might be a good thing. So we did that with students. Then what we're doing now, let's see if I can come up with it. Uh, I know we have some. Okay. So what we're doing now, this is a, this is a pathway of filigree and histidine of how it goes. But what we're doing now is trying to figure out is if this process, if this histidase and histidine, okay, and the transuricanic acid, if it's important for the acidity of your skin. If your skin is acidic, you generally have a better chance of suppressing any kind of skin disorder. Okay? Or if you have a skin disorder and you apply medication and your skin is acidic, you'll get a better chance of remission of that skin disorder. So what we need to find out is how does this enzyme behave at different pHs okay, and at different temperatures? And that's what we're doing right now. We're trying to publish it right now. And so what we're finding is this. At a very high pH, this enzyme works like these gangbusters. Okay, so that's great. And then, but if it goes down to a pH of 6, then it basically doesn't operate at all. So we think it might have a role, maybe a secondary role, of your skin. Okay. And so, for example, your skin is acidic, it's not operating, 
some reason something changes in you, whatever, it starts to become more basic. If it's above the pH of 7, this enzyme kicks in. You start making transuricanic acid, which helps with hydration, the skin barrier, um, and also with UVB protection. Okay? And so if there's something going on in your body, in your, in your chemistry, okay, and it affects your skin chemistry, this enzyme may or may, we think, has a role in containing the acidity. So that's what we're doing right now. And I'm doing it, yes, with high school, I'm sorry, with college students. And we're trying to publish that too. Hmm. Okay? And so that's that's where I am with, with some of the research. Um, I'll see if I get These are some of the pictures. Um, so I just, I'll leave it up to some questions because I wanted you guys to ask me anything you want. I am, I am really blunt. So don't be afraid. I mean, obviously, someone who's studied body of it. <laughs> doesn't, have, doesn't, have any, doesn't have any problems with saying anything. Um, but I really wanted to 